It's late in the evening and it's Friday evening and I want to welcome our minister and colleagues. I think this is a wonderful day for people with intellectual disability and I really think hats off to Jared Quinn and his team here at Galway. So well done. It's a fantastic event. Many people with intellectual disability may not realise the importance and criticalness of days like today, but I have no doubt that they will in the future. Now I know that it's late in the evening and uh, we had extremely good app chairs throughout the whole sessions and my role was to really speak briefly about what everybody has said but I don't want to be here until 7 o'clock because people said so much so I'm not actually going to do that. So I'm just going to briefly uh, pick out a couple of really key issues that people spoke about um, in the context of today. I mean, we were blessed today to have so many people from international to share their international experiences. And as Maria said, you know, it's often a good thing to be a little bit behind where others are at, because we can actually learn from the mistakes and the challenges and the success stories that people have, 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 have experienced and not replicate those same mistakes. I was struck by uh, our speaker from, from Norway, Brogan, when he spoke about, he talked about reconceptualizing recon social support. And uh, the findings regarding poverty, I think, were particularly of concern. And it is certainly well established that health and quality of life for all of us are highly influenced by levels of income and levels of education. And in my own work recently with IDS Tilda, we saw that only 6% of the population of people with intellectual disability over 40 were employed. Many had never been employed. And out of those 6%, 50% of that 6% were on less than the minimum wage. So many people actually did have very few assets to build upon retirement. And I think that is important. But we should consider how to restructure, how we structure the resources we currently have and what advances that can be made, particularly around the building of um, efforts aimed to improve capabilities, to build human capital, uh, work practices and actual employment for people with disabilities. You know, power comes, knowledge brings power and education is critical for knowledge. So if we're really serious about giving power back to people, we need to do it in that manner. But I think it is important to note what we consider, that we consider what post-Tiger Ireland will look like and to be reminded that the vaunted market economy approach we aspire to structurally is less likely to improve people's to improve people with disabilities out of the poverty trap. And key questions for us are going to be, of course, how we distribute social supports. Jimmy, I think, gave an absolute excellent presentation and very much around the whole human rights agenda, but rights to choice decisions with whom and where you live. And she's very much spoke about, in order to do that, it, this does require access and accessibility. The need for universal design to empower people to realise their potential. And I think that there is a very important critical difference between impairment and disability. It's societies that disable people. And it highlights the needs, I think, for, for, for living options and, and a wide role and, and the need for personal supports that are tailored to the individuals. Um, so we need to see personal assistance and, and, and support, and I think our last speaker spoke about that, uh, the, 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 that funds allocated for personal assistance and ensure that these are not just protected but are also increased. And I do want to highlight one thing that Jamie said. She said, I want to be an ordinary person leading an ordinary life. And I would like to rephrase that and to say to Jamie, you are an ordinary person and as such you need to be empowered to live an ordinary life. I think Etna very succinctly and skillfully outlined the com sheer complexity of policy, the legacy of the past. And I think this is very critical, that we are where we are 
The lives of people with intellectual disability, and my interest has been particularly around ageing, has been highly influenced by a historic point. People are ageing at a particular historic point in time. And their ageing today is influenced by the history of our past. And I think what is very, very critical is that it is not a blame game and that we don't blame people for where services perhaps are currently at. But my concern is that now knowing that there is a better way of doing things, the issue is that when we now realise that there are better approaches, that we just don't continue doing the same thing in an incorrect way, that we now change and move with that. Um, I also, um, so, so I think they were some of the points I think that, that, that Etna spoke about. Um, building natural community supports I think has been a, a, a key thread which has ran through most of the, 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 the presentations of today. We know that real connections, that social connections and connectedness to communities are far more critical determinants of health and well-being than our access to medical supports. And I think that is really important. Martin talked a lot and we heard a lot from other speakers in relation to personalised budgets. I was, I suppose, particularly um, uh, struck uh, by um, he, the, the issue that Martin spoke about and his encouragement to build a coalition across the service sector. And I think the work that Madeleine has been doing um, has, is, is supporting those, that type of initiative. Often, far too often, I think, you know, the change process excludes stakeholders. And once we do that, you know, we often create huge barriers for success. And, and the road to success becomes much more cumbersome. And the challenge, I think, in this country would be to continue to build such a coalition. Brian uh, spoke uh, at length about a, a large number of, of, of very critical things, but I suppose there are four messages which I took out of, of that, of, of his presentation, and that I really do want to reflect on, and I certainly will observe, will observe and evaluate policy and service responses here in Ireland. And they are that details are everything. Money doesn't think, people do, and we need really to invest in people. Whatever the problem, community is the answer. And that you can't just simply bolt new ideas onto old systems and expect them to succeed. And one other thing that's really critical is that we want to avoid making systems and structures administratively burdensome to make it so that it becomes very difficult for people with disabilities and their families to engage in. And we have seen their experiences with this highly bureaucratic, and administratively burdensome system. I think Patricia very eloquently presented to us that if something is worth doing, it's worth doing well. But it takes time to do it well. And as she said, that before you can do something, you have to learn it. You have to understand the necessary steps and that this process takes time. But change occurs at many levels. But I think for change to occur, we have heard it over and over again today, it is going to necessitate a major uh, cultural shift. And we need to be prepared and we need to support people in that cultural transition. I think Barbara spoke very well, much about you know, the issues of value for money. Presentation hi highlighted to me that true value for money approach is value driven and that we are lucky to have this type of leadership, I think, in our country, both with Barbara and our minister, who are interested in new approaches and the inclusion and planning of those likely to be most affected, people with disabilities themselves and their carers. And as was highlighted, the cost of services and the number of staff have gone up, but satisfaction with services have not improved. And this at least challenges us, all, all of us, uh, that new models and models that listen to people with disabilities themselves must now be considered. Madeline, for such a very young 
organisation. I think you have to be absolutely congratulated on the contribution that Genio has made, I feel, to the culture change which is so critical and necessary with, within services in this country. Helping people with disability to advocate for themselves and the creation of an evidence uh, on the impact of costs uh, on, and looking at what, what works best and under what conditions things work best and I think that is, 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 is critical. And as Martin spoke, I reflected, Martin, and, and I just imagined you sitting in a chair, wondering, uh, queuing up for the next space in an institution. And I thought, my goodness, could I even begin to imagine that, you know, we, we would be there. And I think, you know, it's, it's people, we are so fortunate to have people like Martin and those innovative programmes and people like that to challenge the system and, and, and the support that the like of Genio is able to give to support those initiatives. And uh, I think we need to have a willingness to learn from, from these particular ma models. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, Martin spoke about was the challenges for him in rolling back the dependency that had got hold of him. And, you know, very often what we have done within services is that we have created this learned helplessness for people with disability. And I think that is, you know, a, a critical issue. And Andrew last spoke and spoke about, you know, the need to know what works and under what conditions. And I suppose just in summary, we need to know, we, we need to change how people think about disability. We need to give power back to the individual. As I said, now knowledge is power and we need to invest in human, in human capital. Helping people to see new possibilities, new horizons, and dialogues to find commonality and common ground. We need to be prepared. And as I said earlier on, I feel that Martin asked, I think, you know, could he learn something from here? And I think perhaps we've done more preparatory work than we actually realise. And that the work of the demonstration projects by the like of Genio is paving the way. And I think this is so critical. But yes, I do feel, and I take his point, that consultation, consultation is absolutely critical. And critically important, the prize for people with disability is citizenship. And the right to connect in a meaningful lives as valued members of our community. And we need to move out of the way and give them space just to get on with it and do that. Citizenship versus services. Services when needed, maybe needed, but as our last speaker said, must be seen as a means to an end. And, but community has got to be the answer. And we spoke this morning about, do we, is this urgent? And yes, I think it is urgent, and we need to create even a greater sense of urgency uh, for everyone involved in this transition. And I think we are lucky because we have supports to help us in, in, in that transition. But I also feel that we will never move to personalised services unless we move to a strengths-based approach. And we have, for far too long, captured and assessed and focused heavily, very heavily, on needs versus strengths. We do need, absolutely, to embrace a social model, but this does not mean that people with intellectual disabilities, no more than the rest of us, and particularly as the age, have health needs. We need to have a serious focus on health promotion approaches and we need to understand that this health need uh, uh, and we need to understand and empower people with intellectual disability to take care of their own health. And certainly from our work that we are doing, we have looked at huge risk factors for suboptimal health in people with intellectual disability, unless that there's really targeted intervention programs to help people understand and take care of their own health. As I said, we are on a journey and we have great leadership with the Minister and the Department, but we do need to ask ourselves on the legacy of what we want to leave behind. And that is really critical. Our current generation, as I said, of older people, are, are, are aging in a, in, a, in a very historical context. 
And I suppose we need to ask ourselves, what will the prevailing philosophies that will shape services moving forward now over the next number of years be, and that will shape the lives of people mm. with intellectual disability moving forward? And, you know, while much has been achieved for people with intellectual disability, I think much more has yet to come. And this, I think, is only going to be achieved by ambitious debate at every level of human society. Thank you.